Dan Marshall is the game developer who made The Swindle, and he has an interesting vision of what makes a good stealth game. To many of us, the stealth game is a collection of unfamiliar, bespoke puzzle spaces we get into, explore, become better acquainted with, and eventually solve. Think back to a few of the classic stealth-based titles released in the mid-2000s. Sniper Elite, Hitman, Codename 47, Splinter Cell, Thief 2 The Metal Age, even some of the more modern stealth games like Dishonored, Deus Ex Human Revolution, Stealth Bastard, Mark of the Ninja, Gunpoint, Aragami, Alien Isolation. All of these have fixed level design, which makes it possible for players to learn every detail of their environments on repeated playthroughs. It also doesn't matter if players make a mistake or their character gets killed during a playthrough, because in these stealth games there are no enduring consequences. Players can always save their progress or make use of checkpoint systems. Some more generous than others. Because of these two design features that seem to permeate a significant number of stealth games, it could be argued that stealth enthusiasts are routinely being conditioned to play through all such games with perfect, trial and error honed precision, never officially getting killed and never officially getting detected, as long as they're prepared for lots of repetition. And sure, it can look pretty impressive when we see the tactics specialists use to achieve a record-setting speedrun or a crazy action sequence we never thought would be possible. It's fun to go through a process of trial and error when exploring a new environment, testing acquired skills, or even trying to achieve those perfect ghost playthroughs, where you finish a level without being detected by or interfering with the system. But Dan Marshall looked at how these aspects of stealth game design conditioned players to learn and complete a stealth game without fear of failure, and he thought this was, ultimately, boring. So he created The Swindle, a stealth game that grins at the concept of the perfect stealthy playthrough and gives it a proud middle finger. A stealth game in which even the most experienced player will have no idea of what's coming has to live with their mistakes, and will need to make the most of bad situations. Welcome to London. In The Swindle, players control a gang of thieves in a steampunk Victorian London, their objective? To steal Scotland Yard's latest security system, codenamed the Basilisk, before it is deployed and puts all of the city's criminals out of a job. You have 100 days to prepare for, finance, and execute the ultimate heist at London's most secure, most heavily guarded police fortress. Any mission you embark upon costs one day, regardless of success or failure so immediately there's an incentive to make every single day count. If you manage to successfully steal above 80% of the loot in any given mission, a 0.2 bonus multiplier is added to your total for all subsequent missions, leading to some potentially huge rewards for enterprising thieves, and the quicker you earn the big money, the more you can purchase in the way of upgrades and tools for your thieves to use. You start small, in the slums where cash is hard to find in great quantities, and gradually burgle your way through to London's posher districts where the scores are high and the security is tight. So how does the swindle reject two big design features common to many stealth games, and how does that change the player experience? For starters, failure matters, but there are no fail states for getting detected or killed. Marshall realised that persistent fail states are literally dead ends for gameplay. Whether it's a mission failed screen or something equally bleak, persistent fail states don't really affect anything except the player's state of mind, and they don't change anything except the amount of times players will have to hit a restart button. If your thief gets detected in the swindle, there's no reloading, no quitting, and no rewinding. The alarms go off, guards are immediately on alert, traps and emergency doors are activated, the police are on their way, and you need to think about running. 
This presents players with a far more interesting scenario than most stealth games have thought to offer, because it's forcing us to confront the fact that we messed up, and that, one way or another, our mistake is going to cost us. If you make it out alive after getting spotted, that in itself is... <sighs> that in itself is something to be pleased about, and if you don't, the next thief in your trusty gang takes over. Death results in the loss of not just one of your 100 days, but also any cash you grabbed during the burglary, as well as your bonus multiplier. Oh, did I mention the bonus multiplier was tied to the thief you're currently playing as? It is, and it's infuriating to lose after building up a successful run of burglaries, knowing the only way you'll get that lovely multiplier bonus back is to carefully stack a new series of enriching heists. This is so much worse than a game over screen. The Swindle defies conventional stealth games by having the guts to say to players, you messed up, deal with it, live with it. Most rely on a death screen or the player hitting the quick load button, and these are simply not interesting outcomes. You repeat the same process of events with small variations and hope that you won't fail like an idiot or get unlucky the next time around. So, that's one thing Dan Marshall scrubbed from the list of stealth game design tropes. Let's talk about the other thing that absolutely had to be destroyed at all costs, how he did this, and why it works. Dan Marshall did a talk at EGX Resed in London a couple of years ago where he described how his initial build for the Swindle involved fixed level designs with nuanced AI that would spot players, get suspicious, and maybe investigate, in other words, he began by building the kind of thing we're used to seeing in modern stealth games. He eventually ditched both of these ideas for a couple of reasons. He wanted players to readily understand whether or not they could be detected, so he introduced a binary stealth system, complete with unambiguous detection fields for his robotic enemies. As long as players stayed out of these detection fields, they wouldn't get spotted. Incidentally, I think the last time we saw a binary stealth system with this torch beam aesthetic was in 005, and it's kind of neat that a design choice made in a proto-stealth game back in 1981 can be just as relevant for a modern 2D stealth game made in the mid-2010s. Anyway, once Marshall established a binary stealth system, his designs for the Swindle's AI gravitated towards fixed patrol patterns and behaviours, because there was no longer any need for them to investigate player activity. The swing from a passive system state to an active system state was immediate and irreversible. Either the player was spotted and all the alarms went off, sending enemies into alert mode, or the player remained unseen and the guards went about their patrols. The Swindle features a varied cast of enemies, more than you would probably expect to find in a stealth game and they all have tailored defences and characteristics that can throw off even the most careful of burglars. However, they are more predictable compared with the enemies we've seen in other modern stealth games, which makes it a case of the player waiting for an opportunity to knock them down without getting spotted or killed by their defence mechanisms. A few, such as this satanic monstrosity, react to sounds made by your thief jumping on nearby surfaces, so these kinds of enemies can be a bit more dangerous, but most enemies will react to visual detection alone. Dan Marshall figured out that it's not always fun to try to guess what the enemy might do next, so he simplified their behaviour, while including a vast range of enemy types, defence mechanisms, scanning abilities and movement patterns, to keep players on their toes in a different way. He also figured out that it's not always fun to know what to expect inside a building full of guards. The Swindle's AI and detection systems may have had some of their nuance removed, but Marshall made up for this by adding more nuance to the game's level design. Instead of being a carefully tailored series of static environments, every single mission in his revised version of the Swindle is procedurally generated, filled with random obstacles for players to overcome and loot for them to steal. By doing this, the game throws open the door to player improvisation, with random micro-puzzles and challenges. It gives us a choice to engage with potentially fatal situations and come away with big rewards, or to walk away if we think the risks are too great. 
By coercing us into an intense relationship of give and take, across game environments we can't predict, the swindle makes us realise that living with our choices in stealth games is more interesting than pretending we never made the wrong choice. After I played the swindle, I noticed a change in the way I wanted to approach other stealth games. If I got detected, instead of falling into the loop of reloading my last quicksave or checkpoint until I didn't get detected, I'd work with the situation and try to survive, and get myself back to a point where I once again had the advantage. Of course, not all stealth games let players do this, but hey, The Swindle is a stealth game that made me think differently about how I played other games in the genre, and I would say that's an impactful thing for a game to achieve. It made me realise how loads of stealth games I'm still a big fan of have gradually pushed my brain into a pattern of iterative gameplay, where I'm putting pressure on myself to solve their puzzles without officially getting spotted or killed. If I mess things up, it's back to the latest checkpoint or quick save. Marshall's approach to this perfectionistic conditioning has been to chuck it out the window. Perfection is admirable, but it's also just a little bit boring. And it's telling that in the swindle, true perfection is an unattainable goal. Don't get me wrong, you can learn to play the swindle well, you can even finish it without losing a single gang member if you really, really know what you're doing. And if you're lucky. And patient. And good at dealing with anger, but you will never achieve a playthrough where you manage to steal every piece of loot in every single mission. When you start the game, your first task is to collect £100, just £100, to unlock the essential hacking tool you'll need to break into money storing computers. You will literally have to walk past the machines with the big money, knowing you can't get to them yet. Depending on how much loose cash is on the ground, you may have to do this twice or more. That's two missions or more, two days or more, where you have to ignore most of the loot in order to make progress. Even once you upgrade a few things, it's impossible to guarantee a mission won't put a room full of loot just out of reach of your current skill set. The point of this is to make players think about what gadgets or tools they would need to break into these spaces, maybe save up for them. On the other hand, all of this makes the feeling of achieving those rare, 100% lootings so much sweeter. I'm going to go ahead and say that finishing the swindle on a ghost playthrough is extremely difficult, if not impossible. You need to disturb and pull at the system. Guards will have to be neutralised, walls will have to be blown up. If you attempt to ghost the swindle, I wish you luck, because that's not going to be a fun thing to try. But w <laughs> wait, wait. I've just realised I'm lying to you. Not about trying to ghost the swindle. Seriously, don't do that. Rather about the idea that Dan Marshall designed this whole thing as a great big middle finger to stealth game perfectionism. You see, each time you die in the swindle or get caught out by a security system and set off the alarms, it's teaching you something. It's getting you to be... better. You acclimatise and you learn and you're more cautious as you make progress towards that big heist at the end of the game, where Scotland Yard is all that stands between you and success. You're not learning to push a reset button whenever something goes wrong. You're learning how to pull off the perfect heist, the only heist that truly matters. As those 100 days tumble down, your burglar's arsenal swells, and your skills sharpen, and then on the big night, you've got to be perfect. No mistakes, no slip-ups. It's a different kind of perfectionism, one that I would argue has a positive impact on the stealth game experience. It's just a question of whether or not stealth game enthusiasts can learn to live with failure along the way, to accept that the imperfect burglary and its consequences can teach us more about being a successful thief than the perfect heist and its total lack of consequences. Mm -hmm.